Hello, everybody. How's, uh, how's everybody doing? How's your day going at Big Day to LA? Going well? All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. I know everybody's excited. This is going to be a, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to make a couple announcements. Uh, who likes parties by a show of hands? All right, cool. Uh, I'm a little worried that there were that many hands down, but uh, for those of you who enjoy parties, there'll be one here in this room at 6.30, so uh, please don't miss it. Uh, it's going to be fun. We're going to make it worth your Saturday evening. Um, and so we're also going to be passing around pieces of paper. We'd like you to put your, um, put your name and the company name down, and that's going to help us, obviously, you know, uh, keep this momentum with Big Data LA uh, going. It's not in here. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for the clarification because I want you to not miss the party. So it's going to be outside by the patio, right? I believe so. Anyway, follow people wherever people are going to go, okay? <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so we've got Derek here from Zest Finance. He's going to tell you all about it. But uh, yeah, this talk is basically going to be uh, around um, algorithm selection and predictive modeling. So without further ado, Derek, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Armin. Yeah, so like Armin said, um, this talk is really be, going to be about algorithm selection um, and trying to match that to kind of the inherent structure in your data. So first slide. Okay. Um, I don't know how many people actually know about Zest. Um, we were founded in 2009 by Douglas Merrill. Um, this is a list of basically a lot of the different um, people we've raised money for or from. Um, you know, kind of gives some idea of the composition of our team. Uh, one of the best things about working with Zest or working at Zest is um, the diversity and the quality of people we get to work with. And we are based, oh, sorry. And we're based in, uh, in LA. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll try. All right. So uh, our mission, uh, our mission is to make fair and transparent transparent credit available to everyone. And so kind of how are we going to do that? Uh, we build a technology platform um, to help us achieve uh, this mission. So we're using this platform to make loans uh, domestically, but also to partner with high volume lenders. Um, and you know, there's obviously lots of people, especially in the developing world, that don't have access to credit. So um, we're trying to make, kind of solve that problem as well. So this is a little bit more about the uh, platform that we've, uh, we've developed. Um, as a data scientist, obviously a big part of it is how we ingest data, how we clean data, um, how we find abnormalities in our data, uh, and how do we handle that. It also lets us put these models into production, um, ensemble multiple models, um, and then we're able to do kind of all these different things. So predict probability defaults, marketing models, um, models that can predict uh, fraud, all kinds of things like that. And it's apparently very fast. Okay, so um, I, you know, traditionally credit, uh, credit agencies uh, probably use or use a relatively limited amount of data. Um, but since we're kind of a, a machine learning data science focused company, um, it, it, the idea is always more data is better. So whatever data we can get access to and we can use, we will. And it's really kind of the job of people on our team um, and on the infrastructure team to kind of make that happen. So again, why limit yourself um, to kind of traditional credit data or credit signals um, when there's all this extra data out there? So again, what we're trying to do is turn shopping data and not necessarily shopping data, but um, you know, any kind of data into credit data. Uh, and I don't know if any anybody here has heard of this, but um, again, in developing countries, credit, credit availability, availability is limited. Um, only a third of people in China have a credit history. Um, but on the other hand, there's enormous amount of data and it's an, an incredibly large market. Um, so e-commerce is already at 275 billion. Um, a third of, of this is already over mobile. So a lot of the companies um, have huge numbers of mobile apps, um, and that's kind of a rich, a rich data source. So all this data um, kind of has the potential to create this really amazing uh, credit decisioning platform. So um, the company we partner with is JD.com. It's sort of like 
the Amazon of China, so it's the largest e-tailer in China. And again, we're working with them to turn their wealth of, uh, and of shopping data into credit data. So I guess this is kind of more the technical part of my talk. Um, and we have all this data, we have this variety of data, um, especially from companies like JD. So what do we do with it? How do we turn it into credit data? And one of the first things we always think about is, what's really the structure of my data? And then that kind of leads to, well, how do I match algorithm to structure? So particular algorithms are obviously more suited for different types of, um, of data. And I don't know how many people in the audience have done Kaggle, um, but you know, a bunch of people on our team have. And out of the winning solutions um, that were posted on their blog last year, 11 of them used deep learning, 17 used XGBoost. So how do we decide which one to use? Kind of at a very high level, if you look at the recent competitions, if it's a competition with image, audio, text, speech, anything like that, um, the most you know, successful algorithms have generally been deep learning algorithms. And I guess it's an assumption, but I assume most people have heard of GBM or XGBoost. Um, so I'm gonna mostly focus on those data sets that have more structure, where we might find um, deep learning you know, uh, more productive. So again, this may be simple or basic for a lot of people in the audience, but I just wanna have a picture up here to kind of explain what's a really simple neural net look like. So we have an input layer, two hidden layers, and an output layer. Um, and this is kind of maybe one of the most basics, or nearly the most basic neural net that we could possibly have. But even with shallow neural networks, we can, they become much more complicated. So this is AlexNet, uh, which I believe won ImageNet in 2012 and was kind of a, a big leap uh, forward as far as the performance of, of deep learning. And you can already see here the network is deeper and it also has a large variety of different types of, uh, of layers. So convolutional layers, again, fully connected layers, but also things like max pulling layers. And so we can connect these and make more complicated architectures to deal with, with data that has more inherent structure. So a big part of deep learning is learning representations of the structure that's inherent in the data. So again, this is kind of maybe I'll give people a flavor of what ImageNet is like. It's a much larger data set than this, but for most um, labs that are working with these types of networks, especially with image data, um, this is kind of the benchmark. And we've seen you know, over the last four years in particular, um, the performance of these networks increase uh, dramatically. So I guess back to structure. So, you know, again, when we get a data set, we think about, okay, is there something, is there some inherent structure? What does it look like? Where does the data live? So is there some sort of invariance or equivariance that we believe is in the data? So for example, we have an image and maybe there's an object on image and we want our network to be invariant into for slight translations of that image. Um, so we go in, we have that assumption, we create a network architecture that kind of uses that assumption, and so far it, it's been very, very successful um, in learning these representations. Now, up until recently, I think the, the main way to do this is something called data augmentation. Um, so you'd actually create more data to run through your network, and you would create this data in such a way that it actually, in a way, teach your network to be invariant to certain types of translations and possibly rotations. Um, but now there are more sophisticated potentially um, architectures that actually build um, this sort of invariance into the network structure itself. So this is from uh, a paper that DeepMind uh, released at ICML uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and it actually uses four new types of layers um, to actually encode this invariance, equivariance to translation and to some am amount um, rotation in the network architecture itself. So when we're building these networks, we're kind of assuming that there's this inherent structure. And you know, if anybody's on PCA, it's, it's maybe somewhat similar, but you know, we're assuming that the actual rank or, or the data lives in a much more lower dimensional space. And because we have nonlinear activation functions, um, when we use deep learning, we can actually find you know, nonlinear space that the data might live on. Uh, and in this case, you know, when somebody found or projected it onto this manifold, um, they found out that the classes were actually well separated. So 
I know it's probably a basic step, but um, again, maybe when you get your data set, the first thing you do is you do a low dimensional projection, you do PCA, TSNE, something like that, and you see, okay, what kind of structure is, is this easily separable? Um, and that kind of may guide kind of your algorithm selection going forward. But there's a lot more to, uh, to this sort of thing, uh, embeddings in particular. So going back to text, um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff with text embeddings. Um, obviously, it's data that lives in a very, well, the normal representation is very high dimensional. So can we find a lower dimensional representation of this? and then be able to do interesting things with it. So deep learning has now kind of become the standard for NLP and text. Um, and again, this may be basic, but you know, there have been interesting results from things like word to vec uh, where you do an embedding, and then you actually find that there's a linear relationship between similar concepts. And then you can take these embeddings and actually run them through neural nets. Okay, so I don't know if that was uh, too abstract. Um, I found this particular visualization of a very simple neural network, kind of intuitive way to explain how our network is learning representations. So um, on the leftmost um, diagram, we have two functions. They're not linearly separable. So maybe we think about this as our input to our network. And in our second, um, second layer, it learns you know, a slightly adjusted representation, and now we can see it's becoming closer to the point where we can linearly separate it. And then we have a, another layer, and on that final layer, it's now you know, changed representation yet again, and now we have a linearly separable um, functions. Okay. So one of the main assumptions or priors for deep learning um, and some of these convolutional nets in particular is uh, compositionality. So networks are really, you know, kind of you take the brain inspiration idea out, it's just a composition of functions. So we can see kind of, you know, that it's learning different, different representations at different levels. So maybe the first level, it's learning edges or textures or colors. And then the second layer is really a composition of those. Um, and then the third layer composes those um, shapes that we learned in the second layer into objects that we might recognize. And so we're building this hierarchical structure. And you know, the reason why this has actually been so effective is because this inherent structure actually exists in our data. So again, it's, it's going back to this idea, we, we're trying to fit, we're making these assumptions about the structure of our data and then picking algorithms based on that. So I guess, you know, again, maybe basic, but um, give people an idea maybe about what convolutions, because that's what this is doing, what they look like. So it's really passing this filter over your image um, and using some other layers like we saw Max pulling before, and we're building this composition of more complicated um, representations. And again, this, this is, is, is effective because this is actually the structure that our data has. So, what if we're not working with images? What if we're working with something like time series or text, and it's something with a sequential nature? Um, we don't want to start from scratch, right? So we want something that kind of mimics that structure. Uh, we want something, uh, a, ne a network architecture that mimics the structure in our data. So we have something like a recurrent net. So a recurrent net can kind of be thought of as multiple copies of the same network that pass messages along. And I, you know, maybe some people are familiar with HMMs, it kind of looks somewhat similar, um, but there are some problems with this. So what if the structure of our data actually has some sort of long-term dependence? So my current state um, is kind of determined by something that happened a long time ago. So let's say 50 states ago. How do I pick a network architecture or you know, algorithm um, or model that can kind of be easy to train this. I mean, in, in theory, you could train something like this because it's sequential um, and you could fit it, but it, in practice, it's really difficult. So we can have more complicated um, networks uh, that kind of allow us to fit to this structure. So something like a long short-term memory network. So what this does is it has multiple gates um, that you can kind of see in this illustration um, that allow you to fit with this long-term dependence much easier. So you have an input gate, a forget gate, an output gate. And this helps us learn much, much more complicated structures. 
And then, you know, you could have something like speech, which is sequential, um, but maybe not like images and not like text. So in this case, and again, this is something that was presented at the recent ICML, um, but this combines both recurrent nets and convolutional nets. And you know, this particular architecture kind of did something that was pretty amazing. Um, it was able to, to learn to build a speech system that other than changing the final layer could actually work with both English and Mandarin, which is kind of amazing. So there was no um, hand feature engineering. There was no domain expertise. You could literally take the exact same architecture. And as long as you had enough data, you could learn both of these very, very well and much better than you would in something like an expert system. So uh, I guess I want to kind of go into a little bit like what has happened, and I alluded to this earlier, what's been the trend, and what's really the driver of increased performance. Now a lot of the architectures that I already talked about, um, they have become deeper and deeper, right? And so um, people have talked about the revolution of depth. So I showed AlexNet. AlexNet was not a very deep network, um, but it's still won ImageNet only four years ago. Um, and last year's winner, uh, so I think it was maybe, was it eight, eight layers, something like that. Um, last year's winner was actually 152 layers. And um, you know, the author of this has talked about making networks that were 1,000 layers deep, um, which is kind of crazy, but um, if this is really what's driving it, then I assume we're going to see this actual, um, this improvement uh, rise even more. So it's pretty exciting. So, you know, a lot of the issues with neural nets has always been kind of, again, how do we make them deeper? And again, maybe basic, but you always have this problem of if, you have a, if your data has a more complex structure, if it ha needs more complex representations, you need a deeper network. And there have been results saying, okay, deeper is actually necessary. But making deeper networks, um, you have this problem of saturation. So you can see on the left, if you're using a sigmoid, it, you know, if you go too far in either direction, um, it's totally saturated and your network essentially can't learn. So um, this, the thing on the right is actually an activation function uh, or another activation function. And it was one of the things, I guess, around 2012, 2010 or 2012, that um, led to the improvement of performance along with data, more data and increased um, amount of computation, but it's, it's a relu, which actually um, is kind of the default activation function. Again, I guess this may be like somewhat cutting edge stuff, but um, you know, I, I mentioned there earlier, like the deep network, and this is pretty interesting. Um, the way that we're able to train these deeper networks, or the person was able, the team was able to train a network that was 152 layers, is they use this very specific type of, um, of layer, which actually has a bypass um, identity function, and is actually very, very similar to some of the same things that LSTMs are doing. So it's interesting that some of the, the tricks for each of them kind of overlap, um, and they've allowed us to train much, much better performing networks. So um, I guess this is sort of the end of my talk, but um, a lot of this material ca came from uh, Christopher Ola, who's at um, Google Brain, uh, and Andrea Carbathy, uh, who's now at OpenAI. And uh, yeah, it was to provide a lot of the material um, and inspired a lot of this. And I think I'm done, but uh, I guess we mentioned, um, we also have a booth outside so um, if anybody has really technical questions, they can come and ask me afterwards. Yep. Okay. Uh, I can't really get... Uh, we can take that offline. I can't really get into super specifics about that. Yeah, so Derek will be available at the Zest Finance booth outside. Um, it's just that we have to get ready for the next talk. So thanks a lot.
Great stuff, man. Great stuff. Huh? Yeah, you yeah. killed it, dude. You killed it. That was great, man. Good job. Hey. I think uh, Derek said we've got to take it offline because the next speaker is also kind of... Oh, oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I think he just felt Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. I think that was awesome. Oh, it was amazing. You killed it. Well, I think it's just sold out crowd. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's amazing. <laughs> I get to see her mumbling. But yeah, we didn't want people to start. The room looks a little empty. Oh, yeah. Hey, um, are you here? Is, is anybody there? at the table right now? Yeah. It's Jared and Sherry. I was going to tell you. I couldn't convince him.